here we are again. The Weekly Mac arrives today with a lot of content related to happiness. To begin with, an artist of happiness, the pastry chef Patricia Smith. Our face off section will feature two great debaters, Sue Flack and Mario Serra. And performing on stage will have Juan Caral and the C6. All this in today's The Weekly Mag, presented and directed by Marcella Topor. Welcome back to The Weekly Mag. The great TV host Johnny Carson once said, happiness is finding two olives in your martini when you're hungry. The quote is perfect because it addresses our today's subject, happiness, from an interesting point of view, that of food. And if you ever wondered where the gastronomy is an art, today your doubts will be completely vanished. Well, we'll be joined by one of the most surprising uh, pastry artists in the world who works right here in Barcelona. But before, let's have a look at this glossary. Here we focus on some concepts that will appear during our interview. The first concept that you need to pay attention to is crafter, a person with a particular skill or dexterity in working with the hands. In this case, Patricia Smith considers herself a sugar crafter because she makes pieces of art with sugar. That brings us to our second concept, sweet tooth. If you have a sweet tooth, it means you have a fondness or you especially like sweets, just like our guest. One more word, filling. When making cakes, the filling is an important part because it's the substance or mixture that is put inside it and gives it taste. Besides, when you say the food is filling, it means it makes you feel full when you have eaten it. In the interview, you'll see our guest has brought us a special treat. A treat is anything that gives great pleasure and it's usually related to food or drink, paid for by someone else. Happiness is not only associated with emotionally intense chapters in our lives or with major historical events. Happiness is often the result of a simple moment, such as enjoying a delicious cake. And today we are accompanied by a great pastry chef, a specialist in this parenthesis of happiness, Patricia Schmidt. Patricia, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you very much. We are so happy to have you here. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> it must be great to have a job and to, like this and to make people happy every day. Yes. At the end, you were sharing, you know, and um, your work with someone. And it's great to see when someone comes to pick up a cake and when see the results, the smiles. Mm. Mm. Well, cake designer, sugar crafter, how would you define your job? I think I am a sugar crafter. A sugar crafter. Yes, mm -hmm. because I work with five different sugar doughs to create almost everything. When is it that you actually decide that you want to uh, become a sugar crafter? Mm, I had a, a baby and my, my son was very little and I wanted to, to do something. I had lived in the United States and my American mother would decorate cakes. So I said, you know what, that's what I wanted to do. So I began like a joke, making for a couple of friends and in a Christmas, but then uh, people uh, began to order cakes. I said, no, no, I don't do this for a living. So, but I like it so much that I decided that I would begin studying. So that's when I went to Chicago to have uh, classes at Wilton School for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I never stopped it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so happy making what I do for a living now. Um, your husband, Cristiana Scriba, is uh, probably the most famous uh, pastry chef uh, uh, in our country and you work together and um, you make a great couple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I want to ask you about, you know, um, uh, how has the fact of, of working with, um, with Christian has um, influenced the, the product uh, of your work? I think because of the cultural uh, way of uh, thinking. I always say that Catalans have no stop in thinking and dreaming and they have no limit, I guess. So um, this way of Christian um, sometimes makes me 
make some things that are weird or that I wouldn't do mm -hmm. in first place. Mm. Okay, well, from what I've read and from what I've seen, uh, they said that your cakes are a fusion between French and Catalan uh, patisserie with a touch of Anglo-Saxon uh, um, uh, influences. Uh, how would you describe uh, what you do? No, I think that all the techniques that I have are um, Anglo-Saxon, mm -hmm. but what I look for is that the filling and the cake has to be very moisture and nice. No, it, it, there's no need to have a, a cake that is pretty, but it's awful to taste. And I find that for my taste and Catalan taste, the British and American cakes sometimes can be very dry. I so see. that's mm -hmm. that's why I don't think that I'm only one thing, but a, a mixture. The best of each one mm -hmm. together. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. So you're an expert in sugar crafting and you create all these amazing uh, cakes, so beautiful uh, and delicious uh, as well. So tell me, which um, uh, has been the most spectacular cake you've ever made? It's always the next one, but one so that far. I like a lot mm -hmm. is the, the one we made together for El Bulli. When they close her, yes. El Bulli restaurant, mm -hmm. we made a big dog that had this color, fulfilled with flowers, caramel stones, and lettuce, sugar, sugar lettuce, sugar mm -hmm. eggs, and tomatoes, and it was like a fruit and flower composition on the wow. neck of a on the neck of a dog, mm -hmm. a huge dog was like three by two or something like uh -huh. that. And I, I suppose Ferran Adria was thrilled, no? Yeah, <laughs> yes, and was was all over the, the press because, because of uh, its complexity also. Talking about yourself, what's your favorite cake, if you have one? I like the romantic cakes, mostly with flowers, are my favorite ones. Okay. But I, I love to research about the cake decorating world. I collect old books, like in the oldest ones I can find in this field. And I'm always studying because I, I think that even though you go far, always you come back. So we are watching now people coming back to Victorian cakes, Edwardian cakes, work with uh, pastry bags. So even though we go far, we always come back. That's interesting. And uh, because you come from uh, Brazil, how uh, are Brazilian uh, tastes? Uh, different from uh, Catalan, Catalans. We are very sweet. We are used to the base of most of our sweets is the condensed milk. So we are used to flavors very sweet. So would you say that people eat more um, sugar or more sweet things in, in Brazil than here? They eat more sugar, yes, and more sweet things also. Um, it was good for me because I learned it, mm, to live with not that much, that, that much sugar. But we are used to sweet tastes and also mm, the, the regional things we make in Brazil sometimes are made with a lot of sugar, like rapadura, like uh, a, a sweet made with bananas or, or even the, the dulce de leche made at home. You always take like a kilo, no? A kilo of milk, a kilo of sugar. Yes. So, mm -hmm. you see, very sweet. Um, they said that you have a modernized uh, pastry tradition with elements of new cuisine and healthy products, and you're also very much into uh, specialized uh, specialized bakery for diabetics and celiacs. So, tell me a little bit about that, about healthy uh, pastry. Mm, I think the healthy pastry is the future of pastry. Nowadays in Escriba, we, are not, we cannot be because to work with things for celiacs and uh, you have to have a different room. You cannot have any trace of yes. nuts or anything. Right. But in fact, nowadays, uh, a big um, company in the chocolate field, it's making some experiments because she, uh, it tried, they tried to 
uh, reorganize the, the structure of the sugar. Mm -hmm. So with that, they are making a sugar that is as sweet as the one we have now, but with 40% less mm. sugar. That's good, that's good. Because anyway, do you think we eat too much sugar? I don't know you, I, I, I eat a lot of sugar, <laughs> I confess myself. So you have, you're a person with a sweet tooth, no? You like sweets I like. a lot, obviously, no? Otherwise you wouldn't create these uh, this magical cakes. I like, I like tasting, I like making new inventions, I like um, trying new things. When I go to a restaurant, I begin with the dessert part. Once I decide what I'm having to dessert, then I can think about the menu. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I know somebody who does the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you always leave that, mm -hmm. that space mm -hmm. no, for dessert. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are places that can make you feel happy as you were in seventh heaven. Quite literally, this is the case of today's Home from Home. We are visiting the Montserrat Monastery hand in hand with one of its monks, Sergi Dasis Jelpi. Let's learn a little bit more about him and his lifestyle. This is the cloister of Montserrat Abbey. I am Sergi Dasis, a Benedictine monk of this abbey. I joined the community almost 20 years ago, so it's a lot for me. Uh, before that, I went to high school, to university, uh, I did some volunteering. Uh, my expectation wasn't to become a monk. It was suddenly that I realized this was my place and this was my life. It was like I, I uh, fell in love with Montserrat. Montserrat is a very special place for many reasons. I would say for nature, uh, for culture, for spirituality. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, for me, it's my house. It's home. When they built the monastery here, they knew what they were doing. Many monasteries in the world are built in very special places because nature helps us to connect with ourselves, with the deepest of ourselves. The monastery was founded almost 1,000 years ago, so it's a long time. And this cloister where we are now, it was built by Puchica da Falc. Uh, he did different works in the monastery in the first decades of the 20th century, but there are works of other artists in, in Montserrat, Subirax, uh, Gaudí, uh, there are many interesting things. I think there are two Montserrats. There is one Montserrat from 11 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon, tourism, uh, many visitors. I like this Montserrat. I like tourism, I like visitors, I like people. But there is also another Montserrat, which I like a lot also, and I need it. Very peaceful, silent, from six in the afternoon until next morning. Inside the monastery, it is very quiet. I like this contrast. And of course, when people come, not just as tourists for some hours, but they come and they sleep here and they share with us, I think they discover another thing. I'm the guest master of the Abbey. It means that I'm in charge of the guest house. We are a team of four monks. Uh, and it means that we receive people who come here uh, to join us for some days. They come for a retreat. They come with many questions, I would say. People from different religions also, or people who don't believe. For these days, for example, we have a Lama from Nepal. He came for a retreat, and it's very interesting to share with him. I would say that many interesting people come here and many times also people with problems. They, they look for someone who can listen to them, who can understand them, whatever they share, whatever they, they are living. So the monastery is a place to receive all these people because you discover that uh, in reality, all human beings are very similar. Whatever we believe, whatever we think, whatever uh, language, uh, religion, uh, uh, we are very similar. All of us need to be loved and to love. Uh, all of us seek happiness in life. And yes, I think I'm learning a lot, sharing and especially listening.
our guests will soon know what a difficult question is. In a few moments, they will be answering our mystery question. Happiness can be everywhere, also in small things like a piece of cake. That's why today in the Weekly Mag we are delighted to have here with us one of the country's most renowned pastry chefs, Patricia Schmidt. And uh, having our usual collaborator, Anna Priscilla Magrignan, again, is a pleasure. Hi, yeah. how are you? Hi. Did right. you do all happy. this for me? Well, it was especially for you to okay. make you happy. Thank you. Isn't like that right, like Patricia? Yeah. <laughs> all about happiness. Well, uh, as you've seen, we've uh, redone uh, our set because we're going to have a um, uh, uh, cake tasting today. But before that, we want you to tell us a few anecdotes or curiosities about the world I have to work in order to be able to eat a little bit of this, yeah? Okay, you make yeah, me work. Yeah, so let's see. Okay, let me explain you. First of all, if I talk to you about croissants, which country do you... Th you maybe shouldn't answer because I'm sure, I'm sure you know the answer. But uh, yes. if I tell you croissant, which country comes to your mind, Marcello? Oh, well, uh, France, but I suppose you tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I have to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> Maybe some people know that uh, already. But the croissant, it doesn't come from France, it comes from Austria. Austria. Um, there's mm. uh, this uh, type of pastry before the croissant, it was called the kiffel, and it's the ancestor of the croissant, and it comes, it dates back from the 13th century. Wow. And if we want to see the actual shape of the croissant, we do have to go to Paris, mm -hmm. but it was created by a guy from Vienna, so it's from Austria, and we have to go to the 19th century. Some people say 1838, 1839. There was this guy, uh, an artillery officer from Austria called August Zang, and he found it in Paris, La Boulangerie Viennoise, a 92 Rue de Richelieu in Paris. And he created this shape of the typical croissant, and it expanded, everybody loved it, and now mm -hmm. we all have breakfast with mm -hmm. croissants. Impressive. I mm -hmm. didn't create this story yet, it's for real. <laughs> All right, what other anecdotes do you have about the world of uh, pâtisserie? We, we, can, we can stay in, in France, in Paris, because there's this really famous sentence uh, that a supposed princess said once, uh, let them eat cake. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks, a lot of people say that it was Marie Antoinette who said that, uh, because the peasants, they were protesting, they were dying of hunger, they couldn't eat bread, and it was the main thing uh, from their diet. And supposedly she said, well, if they cannot eat bread, let them eat cake. Just like, if they cannot eat this, uh, they can eat that. She didn't know uh, what, uh, what things uh, the villagers had to go through. They were really poor. But I have to say, it's not proved that she said it. Mm. Rousseau really said that the princess had said that, but there's no proof of that. So everybody thinks it's Marie Antoinette, but maybe she mm -hmm. didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, we can't uh, f find out for sure. But anyway, today we're here to have this uh, amazing cake tasting. Uh, cakes brought uh, to us by Patricia Schmidt. Patricia, why don't you um, explain to us uh, what we've got uh, here uh, on the set? Okay, um, we have this uh, autumn cake to welcome autumn and also because I like a lot to work with the colors of the leaves. One thing that I do not have in my country, there in Brazil you only have summer and winter so I love this part of the, you know, the season because you have all those colorful leaves. It's and beautiful. coming with this and also in the future with the pineapples by the end of October, oh. we brought a couple decorated cookies. Mm -hmm. With Halloween the, the Halloween theme and uh, cake pops that you had asked me before. Yes. That is a uh, little cake on a stick, easy to eat. And, and you don't get your hands dirty. Yes. <laughs> That's important. And it's a treat, it's a bite, you know. Mm -hmm. and it's um, a pop cake. What do they have inside? Is it chocolate? Yes, it's a little, it's a chocolate cake mis mixture with mm. a, a little ganache. We make the balls, we dip it in, mm. in chocolate and we decorate. Oh, yummy. And then the, um, some creations um, with flowers, no? That one, all sugar flowers. It's really impressive. <laughs> These sugar flowers, it's almost unbelievable that you actually made them with your hands. Yeah, and I, ha I have a nice team also that works with me. <laughs> How long does it take to do all um, these places? How many hours Almost, do, do, do yeah, you count them? We need like a week or two weeks to make the okay. flowers and then finish on the cake. It's people who ask for these for special occasions, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, it's usually weddings and, 
And then I try. I, I, I brought this uh, one so you can taste everything okay. that I'm telling you. We were waiting for this moment. <laughs> this is the beginning of the program. You just invited her because you wanted to taste some of the cakes she made. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the truth. Well, <laughs> well, uh, I must um, admit I have a tooth, um, a sweet tooth. I, I love sweets and of course Patricia's uh, cakes. Uh, we need to try them at least once uh, in a lifetime. So, uh, so yeah, why don't we have a bite? Okay, let's go yeah? for it. You want okay. to cut yourself? You want me to cut? I think uh, you'll do it better than me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a, a chocolate cake and has um, raspberry mm. on the filling. Good. Yeah, it's a nice combination. How did you know I love chocolate and uh, raspberry? I didn't. <laughs> I try it. The first one is always well. It's much one of my favorites. To come, to come out. The second one will come out better. Looks good. So it's like um, a sachet, right? No, inside. Yes, it's Similar? a chocolate cake, and the mm. filling is uh, ganache and some uh, raspberry. Tea. If we try this right now, Marcella, I think we won't be able to speak afterwards, huh? <laughs> this looks well, really feeling. I don't know. I'm really I good don't know, and feeling. I'm sure we'll be very happy. Look at this. That's for oh, sure. Gosh. It looks wow. amazing. And I must say it smells amazing as well. Mmm. Well, Pure I need chocolate. to try this. Let's see. People at home, this is really good. I'm sorry you cannot try mm. it. Well, it's amazing. <laughs> well, nice. congratulations. Mm, thank you, you made us very happy. <laughs> mm? Thank you very Liz, much. You need to tell me the recipe. I don't know. We won't. Mm? You had a program in TV3, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. Bougeria a la pastisseria. Mm -hmm. That we could see uh, what's going on. Uh, inside the, the bakery. There's a lot of uh, these kind of programs nowadays uh, that we can see what's inside the bakery or we, uh, people teaching us how, yes. to, how to do this. People want to learn more how to cook um, pastry nowadays. Yes, I think so. Each time more, no? Uh, before it was only about cooking. And, and now, those programs help people to get interested in the matter of the pastry. Did you have fun doing it? Was it stressful? It was, being was in front stressful, of the but it was fun at mm -hmm. the end. And um, people can see the other side of the things, you know, about creation, mm -hmm. concept, and exactly when people go to get the order, the happiness to see done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we enter with the cameras in uh, a party so people could see the way that we deliver cakes also at the at the moment of the happy birthday thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, now that you mentioned uh, parties, I've always been curious why we associate uh, sweetness with happiness. And uh, birthday cakes, um, always, you now we have them for, for special occasions, for birthdays. Uh, why uh, uh, is a sweet, the sweet taste supposed to make us happy? Why do you make this um, Look, association? I have an information that in the 18th, back in the 18th century, uh, in German, people would make a tart for the, the happy birthday person mm -hmm. and would put one candle uh, for his life and another candle for the years yet to come. Mm, for the future. And, yes, and th this, both candles would be lit all day long and by the end it would blow. But I don't know, I know that the I was telling you that the round shape comes from the offers that the pagans would make for the sun and the moon. Hmm. And also it's something that comes back each year and that's, that's the signi signification. Circle of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, um, Ana Priscilla, uh, you, I think you have another anecdote about a uh, TV program. I, I want to tell, uh, tell you, ask you a question hmm. and talk about another TV program. I don't know if you have ever been in Scotland, uh, if you like Scotland. You know they have uh, haggis, they have kilts, uh, they have pipes. And I don't know if you have tried one of the finest things they have. I'm joking, they have a lot of good things. But they have this weird thing, which is a Mars bar, the regular Chocolate, chocolate bar, bar that you can mm -hmm. get anywhere. They do it deep fried. They do deep fried Mars bar. 
it's an extravaganza. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say to people at home to try it. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you're brave enough, you can try it. But it's such a weird thing, and they, there's a lot of people who like it. Have you ever tried that? No. Not really, no. <laughs> and I wonder what happens, because once it, it's... It's recovered with chocolate. They, they do a fi they, they put a filling like a, I think a, like a croqueta. Maybe. Yes, ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. They pan they, fry they, it. Yeah, yeah, they put it in a kind of a batter and then they deep fry it. Yeah. Deep uh, really fried good. Mars Lots bars. of calories, mm -hmm. but uh, you have. And a before <laughs> you can have uh, some fish and chips, and that's complete. And that's the explosion. They also <laughs> deep fried pizza. I have to say, they have a thing for deep frying things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a piece of pizza and they deep fry it too. Mm -hmm. so well, try it. That one is really well, good. Well, Ana Priscilla always uh, tells us <laughs> unusual. <laughs> well, uh, things, uh, things that we uh, didn't know about. And what about this uh, program? We were talking about your program before and uh, there's also a lot of programs now that show you the before and after. Like you have uh, all the expectations and the reality. You have a picture of something. For instance, we want to make these cookies. You have the recipe and people at home try to make them. But, you know, maybe the ingredients are not the best ones. Maybe the the person doesn't know how to really do it. There's even a program now in Netflix called uh, Nail It. I don't know if Nailed you have it, seen yes. it. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some pictures uh, of people that posted what they have, uh, they wanted to do and what they ended it doing. I don't know if we're trying too hard. If we have to just like stay with the basics. Look at that. That's so scary. That's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can see the difference between um, uh, cakes made by uh, professionals there's a, there's a and professional the cakes, uh, well, like homemade cakes. Oh my God, mm -hmm. these SpongeBob SquarePants is really scary. Well, it's kind of uh, frustrating no? to see such a beautiful picture. I want to do that and then the result doesn't really match expectations. Has it ever happened to you, Patricia? She's a professional. Mm, no, but <laughs> yes, I but have heard a couple of stories that so. were frightening, but yes. You know, like the lady that leaves the pen drive for the girl to make the cake and see the picture, the picture is inside, but she doesn't know how to open up and she delivers a cake that looks like a pen drive. Oh, so, that's a good one. <laughs> it's like, you no. Know? Hmm. Anyway. Well, anyway, um, what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? I told you, deep fried Mars bar. I think that's the strangest <laughs> thing I've eaten so far in my life. And uh, you, Patricia? The strangest or most unusual thing? I think the alligator, alligator meat. Wow. Mm. Or, mm -hmm. or shark meat also, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that taste good? Yeah, it's like, it tastes like at the end, like some, some sort of fish, no? Mm -hmm. With a different texture, but. Mm -hmm. I just read that uh, Japan is uh, taking off uh, the shark fin from the restaurants, finally. Mm -hmm. So that's good news. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, indeed. But Scotland is still with the deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on to the next uh, section. But before, I would like to ask you if you've ever been to Singapore. Yes. Actually, we made, a, we made an event in Singapore mm -hmm. at uh, Marina Bay Sands, 8,000 square meters, all edible. We had the hugest uh, chocolate waterfall, was a meter high. And that was in 2014. Oh. And yes, it's a precious city. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, finally, we can surprise Ana Priscilla. <laughs> With that's, uh, that's our beginning. Yes. Well, uh, one of the new sections of this season is e-speakers, in which we invite you to discover countries around the world where English is an official language. And today, we are traveling to Singapore. It was founded as a British trading colony in 1819. The city-state in Southeast Asia has become one of the world's most prosperous, tax-friendly countries and it boasts also the world's busiest port. However, for Lin Po, our today's Singaporean, the most important thing about her country is that it uh, is a paradise for foodies. Check it out. My name is Lin, I'm from Singapore. I have been living here for 18 years and I currently work in a stock photography agency. Uh, I do content, uh, international distribution and partners relationship.
Singapore is filled with skyscrapers. Buildings are very, very high. Even residential buildings are very, very high. So you see it's like a, a not so crowded version of Hong Kong, a smaller version of uh, New York, maybe. It's a very modern city, uh, very, very hot and humid. It has a lot of prohibitions. You can't do a lot of things in Singapore. You can't eat chewing gum. But it is a food paradise. So if you love food, that's the place you have to go. Singapore, you have to visit the zoo and the night safari, both. And you have to visit, of course, uh, Little India, Chinatown, Geylang, which is the, the local Malay community. And my personal favourite is East Coast Park, which is the beach at the east. And the food centre there, that's a very good place to go. Now thinking back with a perspective of you know, living on the outside, um, I think the most important person right now to highlight would be Lee Kuan Yew, who was our founding leader in, in the beginning when Singapore separated from Malaysia in 1965. He was the guy who led Singapore from a third world country to what it is now, which is a first world country. As I said, Singapore is a food paradise, so basically when you go there, you don't stop eating. Like in the, in the morning, you can have breakfast and you eat a bowl of noodles, wonton noodles, or you eat something which I love called the chai tao kue, which is a carrot cake chopped into small pieces and then fried in a wok. If you like spicy food and you want something local, we have this dish called laksa, which is also one of my favourites. Uh, it's a soup based with uh, coconut milk, um, chilli, prawns, and then it comes with um, what do you call it? thick uh, white rice noodles. I think one of the things that we find amusing is the reaction of uh, foreigners when they try the durian. The durian is a local, a local fruit green in colour and very spiky. And it has a very, very strong taste and it smells... Some people I know, they tell me that it smells like rotten onion. But it tastes very good, it's very creamy. It's, it's interesting, it's a very different kind of fruit. And a lot of people, when they try it, the face that they make is very funny. <laughs> I think that's what makes us laugh. I won't say it is any kind of a tradition or a festivity, but I think what makes Singapore unique is the fact that it is multicultural. You know, it's a, it's a society where four different ethnicities um, live together. The Chinese, the Malays, the Indians, and then you have the Caucasians who come from or, uh, UK. Well, nowadays it's all over the world, Europe and, and, and America, right? And the most amazing thing is that there is no major conflict between these people. They live together, they make friends. You can find in one same street a uh, church next to a temple, next to a mosque. And then there's no problem. As I predicted last week, I'm sure our East Speakers section is going to make our viewers want to travel all over the world. And we are here today with Patricia Schmidt, a great sugar crafter from Barcelona. Patricia. Are you ready for a challenge? Mm, yes. <laughs> yes, very brave. Nothing well, we've got uh, Mark here with some tricky questions. Some Mark? spicy questions, some sweet questions as well. Mm. Okay. Sugar and spice. Some sugar, exactly. <laughs> some sugar and spice. All right. So you have to stick your hand in here as right, you go and pull out the question that you want. I want the pink one. And the pink one. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Open okay. Now. Yeah, sure. Fire away. Okay. These are questions from your head? Yes. Okay. So let's see. What does it say? <laughs> Patricia, can you read it out loud? When you get a call from a telemarketer, what's the most original answer you have given him or her? Mm. 
<laughs> okay. I used to be a telemarketer, that's why I know all the answers. Oh. Yeah, but <laughs> mine I know, not very clever. It's like I'm just getting into the shower, I'm sorry. Okay. Call me later, no? Fair uh, enough, okay. I don't, I'm not creative in this field. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You're not a good liar. You're not a good liar. I'm not a good liar. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, don't worry. What do you say, Mark? <clears throat> and this uh, happens. I actually have a conversation with them. I find them quite interesting. I ask them about their life, what they're doing, etc. You know, I actually you try them out throw the ball that. back in their court. You know, you and at the end a, of the day, you have a lot of time in your life. Yeah? I, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, that's what I, I, that? I usually say, and I know that's gonna sound uh, bad, but I usually say, I'm the cleaning lady. I don't have anything to do with this house. So, oh, smart and that's one. It, yeah. Mm. And sometimes I say, I'm just going to a funeral, so... Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's what I say. You caught me just, in a bad just, moment. Just give you ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, Patricia, uh, why don't you pick up another, another ball and see if um, you like the, the question? Right, that, one, that one you didn't really like. Okay, fair enough. Give it another, <laughs> give it another go. Go on. We, do, we don't usually do this, huh? It's because you made an excellent cake. Mm -hmm. Well, she's an <laughs> exception. Okay, What's the worst out? feature of your personality? The worst feature of and your personality. Best. And the best. Mm. I think that the worst feature... Don't be scared, just say it. No, so nobody's it's the watching. perfection. We it's the perfection. I think it's awful. You're a perfectionist. Yes, being so perfect. Perfectionist. Must be terrible at being there's so perfect. A, there's a say that says that the evil tried so much to fix his son uh -huh. that punched one eye. So sometimes I feel like this. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, the best, I think it's. Um, She's the best pastry chef uh, <laughs> in the world. No, no we, are not, we are always learning, no, but I think the best future is to be through. Truthful. Honest, Truth. Truthful. honest uh, about what I what I think I usually say. Except the telemarketers, when you call, you're not honest <laughs> with them, right? That, then I lie. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but I think that for uh, you know, for my friends and my, my husband, even though sometimes the truth doesn't like, no one likes the truth. But mm -hmm. Truth. so anyway. maybe that's my. No, that's the the bad feature about me, and we are mixing up things here. Okay. Okay. Well, white lies don't count. What about you guys? My worst the feature? Best. Yeah. Uh, the worst feature is I never listen to anybody. I literally keep talking all the time and I don't give people space to talk. To understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I even get lost myself. You're getting one. bored of yourself. Yeah, I'm getting bored of myself. And the, the best one? <clears throat> Uh, I think I'm quite open. I think I'm uh, I'm quite accepting and open of, of lots of things. Mm. That's pretty okay, positive. Good. This looks like uh, we we just entered Freud's uh, room right now. Okay, what's Are happening? Are we being truthful? The, the moment of truth. <laughs> Anna Priscilla, what about yourself? I'm really stubborn. And, mm. and that's good or bad? That's bad. That's really bad. And I don't like people telling me what to do. Usually I don't listen to them and I do what I like to do. Well, you do listen to us. I do listen to you, but just because you it's in English. we're special. <laughs> yeah, because it's You're English. special people, just you. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Mark, why don't you tell us about uh, pastries in Ireland? Pastries in Ireland, mm -hmm. they're full of what? butter and they're full of sugar. And uh, honestly, the best pastries my mother makes. I know that sounds really, uh, you know, my mommy makes great stuff, but she does. My mother's a fantastic pastry chef. She makes wonderful carrot cakes, uh, apple crumbles, What's apple pies. What's the official dessert for Ireland, you would say? Uh, I'd say a, a rhubarb crumble. Rhubarb crumble or pavlova with fresh fruit as well as a typical mm. one that we have. I think is Australians that typical, are kind of uh, Irish. It is. Pavlova well, and when my my grandmother used to make it for me when I was a kid, so it must mm -hmm. be. Also trifle. Do you know trifle? Yeah, yeah? trifle stuff like that. Custard. Mm. These are kind of a more of the dessert of things that we well, use. Well, next yeah. time maybe you should uh, bring us some. I'm terrible at them. Uh, we, when my mom comes in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll have her on. She can. Yes, this is what I mean. When you, the next time made. you go to Ireland, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you bring us some. Uh, Awesome. Some pastries. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, well, thank you for coming today. Thank uh, you. Patricia, Pleasure. you made us really happy with all these <laughs> beautiful uh, cakes and treats. Um, well, we really want you to come back for sure. Okay, so good luck with all thank your you projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for receiving thank you. me here. And thank you guys as well for coming. No problem. Thank you. Max, I'll see you in a bit yep. with uh, Matt. Sure. Okay.
I'm sure you'll be happy to hear it's time to learn some new vocabulary in the weekly mag. Our teacher Becca Bardaka will teach you some different words to talk about happiness. Pay attention. Hi guys. Now, as today's subject is happiness, I'm in a really, really cheerful mood. I feel positive and bubbly and full of energy. And I want to teach you all some really happy and cheerful words and expressions that we use. Like the one that we use to make a toast. Cheers. So say you're in a pub with all your friends and you're having a great time. Someone raises their glass, you could go cheers. We also use this expression really, really colloquially, really informally. For example, if someone says, you look nice today, Becca, I could say, ah, cheers, mate. Or if a friend buys you a drink in that same pub, you could go, ah, cheers. So you're in this pub, yeah? And you're laughing and having a good time and drinking and joking. So we could say you're having an enchanting evening, which means you're filled with great joy, great contentment. You feel bliss. Another word to describe this state of great joy is elation. You could feel elated if you've achieved something really difficult or something you've been trying to achieve for a really long time. So say, after you've run a marathon or if you pass a really, really difficult test or exam, you could say, I feel elated, I feel great, yeah. Um, a synonym to elation, but more in a physical sense, would be radiant. We say someone looks radiant when they are glowing with happiness. For example, a bride on her wedding day would look radiant. It's like the sun is coming out of her face. Yeah. Um, another word we associate with specific occasions would be glee. For example, on Christmas morning, when you're opening up all your presents, you're so excited and happy, you're filled with glee, you feel gleeful. Um, when you feel gleeful or glee, you also get the feeling to sing and dance, which is kind of the feeling that I have now. But of course, I'm not going to, because that would be a little bit silly. Anyway, until next time, guys. Bye. In a few minutes, Juan Queral will be playing live on stage. I bet he'll make you very happy. Our main subject today is happiness and we want to dedicate our face-off to a subject that can be quite controversial. The search for happiness through artificial methods. And I'm not referring strictly to drugs. We also talk about those behaviors that have to do with being happy. For example, eating a cake or buying clothes or spending an afternoon watching the entire season of a series. There are all ways in which many people find happiness. And this is what we want to talk about with our next guests. Uh, Mario Serra, you're already, you're a frequent collaborator of the program. Welcome. <laughs> Thank Great you very much. Great to see much. you. And uh, Suflek, she's new. She's, a, she's an actress. Uh, she lives in Barcelona. Welcome. Thank you. And since you're new to the program, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where you're from? Um, what you're working um, at the moment and how long you've spent, how long you've lived here in Barcelona. Great. Well, my name's Sue Flack and I'm an actress and theatre director. And I've lived here in Catalonia for 28 years. Wow. Um, I'm originally from London. Um, and at the moment I'm preparing a play for next year. I'm not, not too sure which one it's going to be, but every year I, I do a play. Theater. With Escapade Theatre. Theatre, which is theatre in, in English for, for people to, to enjoy English mm -hmm. uh, culture. Excellent. Well, guys, so are you happy today? Because, well, we talk about um, uh, happiness. So how happy uh, do you feel today? I feel quite good. Uh, I like to practice happiness. <laughs> it's not easy, it's not easy. But I think uh, it's the main aim for everybody to get some piece of happiness every day. 
Um, what I like, uh, one of the things I like about you, Marius, is that you're always smiling. You always seem happy, at least. I don't know if you're always happy, but you seem happy. Well, no, uh, happiness is temporary. <laughs> I mean, of course. Uh, it, it's uh, for instance, and you, you have to contrast it with seriousness and maybe pain. Uh, life is uh, all this. But I think uh, that uh, my, um, we have been here in the world to be happy. Because if we are not uh, trying uh, to, to get happy, we are always in conflicts and we are always painful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I try. When you start uh, talking to anyone, I usually get a smile first and then the message will be better. Mm, and positive. Th mm. That will be positive because negative things mm, are all around us. I mean, um, you, you don't have to search for them, <laughs> mm, but uh, you have to search for positive things. Mm. You have to, 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 to search happiness or, I don't know, if artificial, cultural, we can talk about it because it's not easy to Mm, divide things, what is unnatural, what is natural. Artificial happiness, uh, yes indeed, that's a term we want to talk about today. So what do you guys think about this term, artificial happiness? Well, uh, first of all, I would, I would like to say that mm, life, human life, is artificial. We are here in, in a very nice set uh, with uh, some clothes. Um, we are artful. I mean, uh, nature uh, we, we are biological beings, of course, but nature is not opposed to culture. And so that talking about artificial happiness mm, seems to be negative because of induced happiness by drugs, for instance, like uh, searching paradises. Mm. But I think I would make some relativity of this concept of uh, na natural and unnatural happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is relative in life, in fact. So what do you think? I think uh, it's important to focus on, um, you were talking about searching for happiness. And I think one of the problems today is that everyone, it's on everyone's agenda, everyone's searching for happiness. And they're looking into artificial things to give them happiness, the, the topical thing. More money, a better job, uh, more clothes. And we all know that when we go shopping and we buy something we like, it gives us an adrenaline kick. The dopamine kicks in and we feel happy, but it's very, um, it's passing happiness. And I think what's more important is to look for a state in which you can recognize when you're happy, but also recognize when you're not happy and accept that because we can't always be happy. We, we you know, there are going to be times, but that's fine. As long as we focus on that, mm -hmm. happy times will come. Um, I agree, absolutely, because everything is temporary, <laughs> life is temporary, happiness is temporary as well. But, of course, it all depends in which is your definition of happiness. If it's only euphoria, euphoria is not happiness. Euphoria is a state of uh, maybe a, um, emotionally very, very intense and sometimes um, People who try to sell you something, <laughs> tries to sell this euphoria as a part of happiness. I'm not talking about that. I mean, uh, I love to know that you are working in theater. Uh, theater, I, I have been very happy in theaters and sometimes I cry. Of and happiness. I am happy as well yeah. because of the contrast. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, that's yeah. it. I mean. Of course, you, you can make um, a, a sort of um, a postcard of happiness being in an island with a dry martini or a daikiri. Well, that's just a picture. But anyway, I uh, put the focus on searching, as you say. Searching it, this is the main aim, searching happiness, because if you are going to search some sadness, some painful, they, they, they will come to you. Anyway, mm. but if you search for happiness, you're constantly looking away from yourself. And I know that it's very um, fashionable nowadays, mindfulness. And I've been looking into it because I was a little bit, oh, mindfulness, what's that? Another fad, you know, another thing. But looking into it, I, it actually makes a lot of sense because uh, we, do, um, we do so many things in a day, in a life, 
in a week. Uh, and our mind wanders and our mind is constantly looking for that, that um, injection of happiness. And actually you can find it so much more simply if you, if you practice mindfulness. Personally, it's a new concept to me. I'm thinking of maybe taking it up uh, because I am a person that's constantly looking for the next experience. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, we are a very unhappy species. Um, you, you, you just need to look at the happiness rates of countries. Um, Finland's always at the top, you know, this kind of thing. And we're in this, this search for happiness. And everyone's saying, well, the Buddhist, feeling and uh, which is basically the mindfulness is saying it's here it's here don't look any further don't go out and buy clothes don't go out and have that extra bottle of wine you know just sit feel the wind on your skin um and that we would probably be a lot happier if we didn't go in search so well, find the happiness inside you maybe of that, course that, that that makes a lot of sense but is is it not okay to uh to use substances, I don't know, sweets or mm, something else, or go and out and buy. Why not? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean everybody you, uh, you can has put your their own right to, yeah. to be happy, and uh, uh, being happy is, yeah. uh, like you said, very personal and very uh, relative. So is, it, is that not right um, to, um, to, uh, to find ways of uh, artificial happiness? Hmm. Uh, I would say that um, it, this is a personal decision. I mean, uh, I, I would say that it's a question of freedom, uh, of freedom, individual freedom, because mindfulness, that's okay. Uh, I, I can understand. I don't like the word because now they are selling it as a new concept, so you have to <laughs> pay for it. Uh, but I, I can agree with that. But not everybody is uh, like a Buddhist monk. I mean, Ravelet <laughs> was a, a great uh, carnival uh, writer, and everybody can take happiness of uh, making, uh, 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 eating, for instance. Sometimes, of course, there are limits. Your health is a limit. Mm -hmm. Law is a limit. I can't uh, exactly. talk about marijuana or not, and we can debate about uh, this. Is but of course, I'm against drugs. I'm against, but what about cognac then? What about um, liquors that uh, we, we, they, they are plenty of, of them on all bars? So I would say that the search of happiness has to be an individual question because I can understand, for instance, people, runners, people running, running away with nobody chasing them. Why are they running? Why are they happy? Um, getting tired and very tired because they are running uh, up the, uh, of a mountain, mm -hmm. going to a mountain. But if they are, who am I to judge them? Mm. I mean, this is a question of morality, in fact. Mm. Mm, I, I can establish limits, uh, not, having uh, not, not getting harm. Mm, not, not you, not the others, of course, but that's the only limit, I, I would say. Uh, it, the, the same that in sexual freedom, for instance if it's between or among adults and they consent, they, they like any practice between them, a coded practice, who am I to say this is not good or this is not a good way to get your happy if you mm. are? Yeah, he's being very convincing. He I think. is. What do you, what I, I do wanna, you think? So? Sorry, I want to pick up on the, the runner thing and I think what they get out of that is fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Um, they suffer, but they are very fulfilled at the end. And I think happiness comes through fulfillment, not instant gratification. And I think that I agree with you on these small um, sins, peccadillos, as, they, as we call them in English. Um, <laughs> peccadillos, oh, peccadillos, nice. yeah. That's good. Um, like, you know, a little bit too much wine here, that extra cake that you yeah. shouldn't. But what happens is when people rely on those things for their instant gratification, that's when it all gets me uh, messed up. And that's when people get messed up, obviously, when you get addiction or, over, you know, look at the massive problem we have with uh, overweight, obese, obesity, uh, drug addiction, that sort of thing, because we are living in a um, one-use society, usare y tirar, no? The, yeah, the, yeah. They use it and throw it away. So um, let's have more, let's have it mm. now, you know, and let's get there as soon as possible. And but but that, that, that has not to do very much with 
uh, the search of happiness because they try to to get it through it, but they are not happy at the end at they, all. They think so they I, are. I can yeah. understand this uh, the way of effort as a way to get yes. a, a good uh, prize like a runner, which I'm not going to do it, I can tell you. But uh, I can understand that. Uh, but uh, the thing is that happiness is a sort of horizon where you try to go there, to go there. If it is instantly, when I, I, I used to be a smoker, and uh, it's 10 years uh, uh, by now, 10 years ago I, I did smoke, and it was not hap a happy thing for me. It, it, it got an instant satisfic satisfaction, mm -hmm. but it, uh, I was like nervous about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I couldn't. You're I, happy I was an now addict. that you're not smoking. I'm very happy yeah. mm -hmm. not smoking exactly. Excellent. Now. And I am very happy that you guys came today. Ah, it's awesome. well. okay. um, Are you happy? Anyway. Are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'm supposed to, to decide who is the who the winner is but um i'm afraid i can't do that you know because both of you are kind of were very convincing and i think that's a draw today right. thank you for coming and see you next time thank, thank you, you very much okay now we are taking a short break we leave you with a quote by an american writer and political activist helen keller she was the first deaf blind person to earn a bachelor of arts degree have a look Music is a way of expressing feelings, and since today our main topic is happiness, music could not be missed. Today we've invited a musician whose compositions have been compared to top artists such as Jeff Buckley, Ben Howard and Elliot Smith. Joan Karat, thank you so much for coming. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. So tell us, what's your story with the C6? <laughs> well, um, they are uh, my friends. I mean, I was uh, playing by myself for two years, so it was kind of boring traveling alone. I mean, it's good because you learn a lot, but you want to share the experiences. And one day I was driving home and I was like, maybe I should call my friends and make this uh, a band and, and have some fun. Why this name, the C6? <laughs> Well, uh, at, at the first, uh, first time we were Juan Caral and we were playing some festivals and people was like, but I mean, Juan and the Carols, Juan Caral is the band or you? And I was like, no, it's me, it's my project, but they're uh, my friends. Yeah, you, you need a name, blah, blah, blah. And we were thinking and thinking and and we were uh, playing in a place called Dream Sea in the north of Spain. And we were surfing and one of the C6 mm -hmm. uh, started getting dizzy in the water. I see. So <laughs> the name came from there. Yeah, from there. Mm, I see. Well, tell us, what's the uh, uh, secret of you guys producing uh, so much because um, since 2013, if I'm uh, not mistaken, yeah. in that case uh, you can please correct me. You've, you've published four albums, almost one per year. So what's the secret um, for being so productive? Well, well spare time maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, because you do um, other things apart yeah. from music. No? Yeah. You are a copywriter. I'm a copywriter. You can say that. Yeah. Yeah. I write stories for advertising. Well, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not methodic. I mean, I'm not the classic guy who is every morning with a guitar. Like Wakes that. up at 6 a.m. and starts no. composing. No, but I'm, I pick the guitar like every day for a moment and start playing. And if something it's interesting, got my phone. Mm -hmm. I made a video and, and, and then like uh, six or seven months later I'll check all the videos and maybe I think it's the time to record some stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, this year you've published your second album with the CC called mm -hmm. uh, Purple Cannon. Yeah. How would you describe it in terms of uh, musical style? Well, it's different because we came from, they say like 
folk Americana music. And um, it was, uh, we did the songs in Tordera, in mm -hmm. the uh, house of the, uh, the ex-drummer. Mm -hmm. And there were like two different concepts of uh, compositions. One was more like our kind of style, like this Jack White riff, Black Sabbath, this stuff. This style, and yeah. there, there was another line that was more like 80s pop. I'm not a big fan of the 80s pop and never listened so much. I mean, I like The Cure and bands like that, but... And I know you, at, the, at your beginnings, you, you yeah. really liked Nirvana a lot. Yeah, yeah, they were my inspiration. I was, yeah. I remember when Kurt died that we were watching TV with my, with my parents. We were watching a film and they interrupt the film to say that um, this guy was dead. And I went to my room crying, like mm. <laughs> listening to all the happy, albums. Happy and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, uh, a Purple Cannon, how would you describe it in just a few words? Mm, it's power pop, maybe. Okay. <laughs> maybe it's not. <laughs> what does that mean, power pop? I mean, we, we all came from uh, rock and hard rock bands. Uh, before this, uh, before my project, I was playing drums and guitar and punk band, bands and rock and roll bands and all the other guys too. But now we are making like pop or indie. Okay. But we have a, a rock mm -hmm. uh, background. You guys uh, do a lot of gigs at the moment? Yeah, we're playing. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy because we have like two different uh, formats. I mean, acoustic and the full band. So we made uh, a lot of gigs. Since today's uh, topic is happiness, uh, mm -hmm. each program has a, a, a theme and today we talk about happiness. I would like to ask you um, uh, if you're happy with the results you've achieved so far uh, with your band and what makes you happy? I'm super happy. I mean, That's good. Yeah, because I'm playing with my friends, we're making our music and we're traveling and, and having fun all around. Mm -hmm. making Is this jokes the secret the of happiness? I don't or know. Or you have another one? Uh, well, yeah, I have a daughter. <laughs> She makes me happy every single second. And How old is she? It's uh, 15 months. Yeah. Okay. Ah, so no, this I is think the first time has... for you, no? Uh, yeah, yeah. As a father. Yeah. Your first child. Yeah, yeah and it's a great experience. Yeah, yeah. I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so well, I've got two as well, so but I know I what it's like. It's great. I know it's like a topic, but you can find happiness in small things. You don't need to think uh, big. So. I totally agree. Uh -huh. uh, okay, what are you going to uh, perform for us today? I'm going to perform a song called Ona. It's the name of my daughter. And I wrote the song with my wife. And Is she a musician as well? No, she's uh, an artist. And she's the one behind all the artwork, the albums and and some other stuff and it's uh, it's about how we would like Ona to be without being an influence I don't know if it makes sense and well we would like her to be free happy love nature and I don't know uh, but she never takes a no for an answer I don't know like, well, things like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this matches perfectly the theme of our program, which is happiness. Thank you, Joan, for coming today. Great pleasure. Good luck with the projects. Thanks. And we are looking forward to listening to your music. Okay. And while Joan Caralpi is tuning up, have a look at more language tips. Do you know what being like a dog with two tails means? Well, listen to our teacher, Rosie Bradshaw, and you'll learn this one and even more sayings.
Hi, so today's topic is happiness. Now we all know that life isn't always easy, but there are some people that just have that special positive attitude. You can say they have zest for life. Now there's lots of different ways of saying that someone's happy at a particular point in time. If they're really, really happy, for example, the highest state of happiness, you could say they're in seventh heaven. You could also say some, someone is very happy. You could say they're jumping for joy. Like a little kid who's been given tickets to go to Disneyland, for example. He'd be so happy, he'd be jumping for joy. Happiness also makes you feel a certain way. It makes you feel really good. If you get a promotion, for example, at work, you could say, I feel so happy, I feel like I'm just walking on air. Sometimes as well, happiness makes you have a physical response. If you feel very emotional, for example, you could cry even. So you'd be weeping for joy. These tears aren't of sadness, they're tears of joy. Sometimes we do things just because, just because it amuses us or makes us happy. You could say we're doing this just for kicks. Like for example, I could be with my friend in a restaurant and say, hey, just for kicks, instead of ordering the first course first, why don't we order dessert first? How about that? Anyway, in any case, why don't we all think of the life of Brian, which will make our lives much easier and just always look on the bright side. Thank you. Goodbye. mountain let's dance on marshmallow clouds the stars are shining like poles in the purple sky and you want to feel all the things that are real a giant wave it's time for the perfect ride Tunnel of colors Sparkles in the sunlight You want to spread Your wings and Fly your dreams The summer rain is finally falling again your soul her turns into a rainbow and then you and you want to climb the biggest tree and you dance and you are free and you want to run into the woods and finally Many people practice yoga to feel healthier and happier. And our next portrait features a yoga teacher, Jerzy Badak, who claims that yoga helped him make friends while traveling. And he's also keen on a very special discipline called acro yoga. Let's find out more. Hi, my name is Jerzy. I'm a yoga and acro yoga teacher. I came to Barcelona by chance to attend the yoga conference and then after the conference I decided to spend some more time here and then at some point 
I just thought I really liked it here a lot, so I decided to stay. It was after a while when I was changing jobs or I, I quit my previous job and I went traveling a little bit. I was traveling around in the world. I spent some time in Asia, Australia. And then when I came back to Europe, I just by chance came through Barcelona and then stayed. And while traveling, I got interested into yoga. So I started to practice yoga, then also came across acro yoga, so I started to practice acro yoga. Then at some point I decided to get, into, uh, to get a little bit deeper into my own uh, yoga practice. So then I decided to do a yoga teacher training. So the idea for me, uh, me to do a yoga te teacher training was not to start working and teach yoga, it was more to pro progress in my own practice. And then later on, once I got a little bit more into acro yoga, I also at some point decided to do an acro yoga teacher training. And I did that. And then after the training, I just naturally came to start teaching acro yoga. Yeah, in acro yoga, you combine uh, yoga practice. Usually what we do, we do a yoga warm up. Then we do some group warm ups, warm ups in couples. And then uh, you combine acrobatics with the yoga part as well as part of the acro-yoga practice at the end is therapeutic flying or uh, Thai massage. So you also combine therapeutic arts in the acro-yoga practice. I really like acro yoga because it gives, it's a way of connecting with other people and it helps you to build connections with people, it helps you to progress in, like, in your personal development, uh, sometimes uh, as well to kind of go over your own barriers because sometimes you would say, I mean, naturally nowadays in the society it's like it's usual not to be in such a close contact with other people. So for, for example, I like yoga as a practice because yoga gives you the opportunity to connect with yourself personally, while Akka Yoga gives you the opportunity to, to connect with others. And you also build relationships. It's also quite common that in all big cities around the world you have acro yoga communities so basically when I travel what I tend to do I tend to connect with local communities and then you're not anymore like a tourist you're part of a community you're part of an acro yoga community maybe just in another country in another city Here and there, an Englishman and an Irishman talking about happiness. Can you believe it? Well, it's happening next. And it's time for our last language tip of today, it's coming from our Australian teacher, Tim Guinea, who's going to show us some more phrasal verbs. Take note. The famous Russian author Leo Tolstoy said, if you want to be happy, be. Well, easier said than done. So today we're talking about phrasal verbs to do with happiness and also unhappiness. So something that would make anybody unhappy is to tear apart from their loved ones. Well, to tear apart, it means to be separated from. And it's in a number of songs and movies. Another phrasal verb that could make you unhappy is to gnaw at. Now be careful, there's a silent G in the word, and to gnaw at is when you have a negative emotion, maybe fear or anxiety, and it gets bigger and it gets bigger inside of you. Something that's less serious is to monkey around. So if someone monkeys around, they act silly and maybe a little crazy as well, and they don't do the right thing. So another synonym for that is to goof off, which they use in the United States. Now I'm a teacher and I can tell you, sometimes my students goof off in class, they don't listen to me and they don't do their work. And it pisses me off. Now, pisses me off is quite strong language. It's an informal way of saying to get very angry. So after a day of teaching, and maybe I'm a bit pissed off, I have to meet up with a friend and we try to cheer each other up. 
So if you cheer somebody up, you make them feel happy and positive again. Um, what we like to do is we like to go to a bar or a restaurant and soak in the atmosphere. If you soak in the atmosphere, you enjoy it and you relish it. And my friend told me about a new spa that's opening right here in Barcelona. And I look forward to going. So if you look forward to something, it means you want to do something with great desire. So my tip to you, if you're feeling unhappy, well, you should meet up with friends and maybe find something to look forward to. Until next time, I'll see you. And it's time for our section here and there. As you know, this season we have achieved the perfect combination of common sense and craziness. Representing common sense, of course, we have here our friend Matthew Tree. Hello, Matthew. Common sense? Okay. Well, that's a compliment. <laughs> you should be happy. No, I've always thought of common sense as boring. Oh, I didn't say that. No? Anyway, uh, okay. um, I was trying to make you happy. Today is the day to be happy. We're talking about happiness. Mm. So, anyway, uh, and representing craziness, there could be none other than our favourite Irishman. Mark, absolutely. how are you? You nailed it. The I craziness, you you absolutely nailed it. You're happy it. with this Well, I'm not sure he's so happy about being the voice of common sense in, in, this, in this little... Yeah, it's like ensemble. common sense Englishman and the yeah. crazy Irishman, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the beginning of a joke. All right. Well, anyway, a friend of mine uh, always said that uh, unhappiness is in the details. So, uh, what do you guys think? I don't go into details too much. I'm extremely superficial and I'm quite happy with that. Oh, I don't okay. know about you. Good answer. No, unhappiness is like, um, it's like when people talk about happiness, the opposite of happiness isn't unhappiness, it's just being okay. You know, like, <laughs> how are you doing? All right. You know, that's the opposite of happiness. But unhappiness is, there's no details about unhappiness. Being unhappiness is horrible. You know, it's like when your partner leaves you or, or someone you love dies, you know, or you don't get published for 20 years or something, you know? So you just... talk about your life here? Or... <laughs> <laughs> well, at certain moments. Sorry, yeah. yeah just, just certain moments, Mark, you know, not the whole thing. Um, but it's, it's a horrible state of mind to be in. Of course. Um, totally agree. What about you, Mark? What makes you happy? What's happiness for you? Um, <clears throat> happiness. Um, this, like, I don't know. I haven't quite figured out what but makes what me makes happy. But what makes you happy? Uh, small, small things like uh, moments with my... Uh, yeah, a piece of cake, uh, a nice hot cup of coffee, uh, walking my dog. Um, I Coming don't, here I don't to know. the weekly kind of, makes you happy. It makes me being really happy. Being here makes you happy, no? It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're trying to force the words down my throat. I feel like I'm being, you know, coerced into being happy here. No, no, <laughs> I am actually happy. Uh, I'm happy with You're happy all the time, time yeah. no? Generally, yeah. Mm, lucky I, you. Anyway. I don't think about it too much. <laughs> I know you've uh, recently visited a place where a project called Villas Palbanasta mm -hmm. is being uh, carried out. So uh, what did you see there? Funnily enough, nobody knew about it. We were the only people that knew about Villas and Benestar. It was uh, in Hostel Rik, which is in the Girona province, I believe, uh, where you guys are based. Near Monsen, right? Near Monsen, exactly, yeah. And uh, basically the idea was that the university were going to uh, do a study among the people of Hostel Rik and Breda and try and help them uh, improve their day-to-day. I don't know exactly uh, did they succeed because not many people knew about it when we went there. And if you watch the video, you'll see that I'm not quite sure were they that really that happy. But uh, well. okay, let's have a look. Welcome to Hostel Rik. Here they're doing a study in this town to try and make the people feel happier in general. First of all, I'm going to look for my inner happiness, and then we're going to find out about the people around here. motorbike's making me really happy. It's nice to have something big between my legs for a change. What makes you happy? Ride uh, with my motorbike, with some friends. Do you like to ride anything else? My girlfriend. My girlfriend. Living here, I'm happy because it's, it's a very peaceful area. You can go out, you can walk and enjoy the green because I love the green. 
the color green. We have the monsoon here. It's very little of paradise that we have here. You said you like the green. Do you smoke marijuana? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Does that make you happier? Sometimes, yeah. I love trekking and, and I like go to the mountain and smell the nature and, and enjoy the nature. Fucking flies. When I'm on holidays, I'm very happy because I don't have to work and I don't have to think about anything. Flying with my sons, my family makes me happy. What makes you unhappy? Bad people who don't help the other ones. People being ill, yeah, illness. Politicians. <laughs> Politicians. City, big city. And the people who is around me don't pay attention to me. Is there anything taboo or something that you shouldn't do but it makes you happy anyways? No, I don't sure? do those kind of things. <laughs> yes, but I will not say here. Maybe sex with two or more persons, <laughs> you know? Persons in general, or two women? Well, two women. If you want to be really happy, visit Hostel Rig, yeah. visit Danny, he's looking for a trio. My house is open. His house is open. Welcome to the jungle. Are Catalan people happy, do you think? I think yes. What makes Catalan people happy? Be Catalan. Oh. Well, I think we are happy, okay. yeah. We are open, we are happy with other people, we are happy traveling, we are happy with people traveling here, coming here in Catalonia. I think we see life as something incredible and we have to profit it. I think we are very happy people. It's inside of us. I don't get that, I don't get that impression. I, I find you guys complain a lot. Yeah, we complain a lot, but we're happy. Reading really makes me happy. And what makes me even happier is people hating on things. Like this writer. He seems to hate bicycles, but I love it. Well, uh, well done. We really enjoyed it. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I loved doing it. It was so much fun. I was really happy. Do you like so, the, the writer at the end? Did you notice who it was? <laughs> no. <laughs> who is it? What's, what's interesting what's is What's his that name? <laughs> yeah, For a man okay. who allegedly hasn't published anything in 20 years, we found something published <laughs> in Hostel Reek. <laughs> <laughs> you have a niche. Well, Matthew Tree, at least, you know, you're famous in, in Costa Rica, no? Well, among the readers of Catalonia today, <laughs> <laughs> all four of them. But, um, uh, no, the, the funny thing about that video is uh, when, it, when it comes down to it, like, what makes people happy, basically, is sex and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's all they were talking about. You know. Now, that they were also talking about nature, nature. about reading, yeah. about being with the family and friends. No? Yeah. Well. Maybe we just focus on different things. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to cook. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it is true. We're very much basic, basic people. Food, drink, uh, sex, drugs, those are the things, you know, the taboo things that make us happy sometimes. That's what I find. Um, okay, guys, let's see. Um, Mark, you come from uh, Ireland. Yep. Uh, Matthew, you're from London. Hmm. So um, what do you think is the, um, uh, the way happiness is seen in uh, Great Britain and Ireland uh, compared to Catalonia? The concept of happiness, how is it different here and there? All yours, Jesus all yours Matthew. The, all yours. the easy question. It, well, Great Britain, it, it, because in Scotland, for example, it's a completely different thing. I mean, if you see, as I have seen, an Englishman surrounded by, by Scotsmen, he, he looks very quiet and a little intimidated because the Scots are all talking a lot, um, jokes are flying around, their stock of jokes is usually much bigger than his own. Uh, he can't understand half of what they're saying. You know, the whole, that, it's a different setup. But what I do remember very clearly is because as a kid I used to visit my grandparents in Lancashire very often. And the difference between Lancashire, north of England, and London was, was incredible, you know. I, I, I remember seeing, as a kid, my grandmother stopping in the street to talk to people, you know, neighbours of hers, and they'd be chatting away happily, and then they'd move on, and if she spotted another neighbour, another conversation, and I thought, in London, nobody does that. Nobody talks to each other in the street. So it's a, it was a two very different uh, atmospheres. Mm -hmm. And in London, specifically in London, I get the idea happiness is a little bit in short supply. It's an expensive city. Um, it's very hard to, to get, get by in London. Um, I've seen middle class London and I've seen working class London. And everybody seems to be kind of striving 
for something, but it's not happiness. It's just mm -hmm. to keep going, mm. you know, find a reasonable place to live, this kind of thing. That, and they, they drink a lot. This would explain your bitterness towards bicycles then. The fact that you were born in London and you didn't have a lot of happy th things around you, so you, you're hating on bicycles? I don't know, I don't follow. No, I, I don't like bicycles <laughs> since they came to Barcelona, you know, okay. and every day I almost get run over by a bloody bicycle. I mean, I hate the things, you know, I would, I would eliminate them from the city completely. Okay, fair enough. Do you um, ride a bike? No, I can't ride a bicycle. I have no sense of balance. But that has nothing to do. That has nothing to do with my dislike of bicycles. Mm -hmm. Do you drive <laughs> a car? No, I can't drive. No. Okay. Oh, no. I tried when I was 18. Um, I had a crazy driving instructor. Uh, who did in fact only think about sex. He would talk about <laughs> sex the whole time when he was trying... What's wrong with you guys? I mean, whatever, it, it, it doesn't him, matter not the me. topic, you always <laughs> you know, end up talking about the same thing. I was trying to drive the car, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, and he kept, he kept sort of pointing out women in the street and talking about what he did with his girlfriend, you know, which was a lot more That's information That's kind of what happened in Hostel Rick and Breda. He asked about people what made them happy and it was, it's the simple things. Mm -hmm. yeah. The simple things. The simple things The little small life. fleeting moment of pleasure. Mm. Some okay. Cases. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's interesting what you said, Matthew, about uh, uh, people being not very happy in, in London. And the funny, the funny thing is that I, you know, you guys joke a lot. You have a very good sense of humor, which doesn't mean humor and telling jokes doesn't mean they're happy necessarily. Well, there's uh, uh, cases of loads of comedians. Uh, the latest one in the news was Robin Williams, who yep. ended up uh, yeah. committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tony Hancock, I don't know if that, you have to have a certain age to mm -hmm. remember Tony Hancock, but he was a really famous British comedian in the 60s, English comedian in the 60s. Billy Connolly had his, had his demons as well, Is right? that right? It's I think he had, he had his demons as well, yeah. Most, yeah. most big comedians have, they struggle with this like inner look, outward happiness, you know, where they have to make everything Everybody laugh in front of them and inside they cry. It's kind of like me. I cry at home at night. Not very happy. Okay, okay. Mark. Well, <laughs> let's not be sad. We're here no. to be, you know, happy today. We want to make you happy today, which is why I suggest we go to the following video. Sure, yeah. It made me really happy, as you'll see. Okay, what, what happens? What can we expect from this video? Expect the unexpected. Uh, I ran into a... Um, a bachelorette party. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine. I was like a pig in shit. Happy. Lord have mercy. Well, <laughs> let's have a look. <laughs> Is there anything taboo or naughty that makes you happy? <gasps> yeah. No, no, no. I'm not sure of answering this. I don't know what to Come say. On. No. Your future husband is waiting to know what makes you happy. Doing it and public places <laughs> having sex having sex in public okay we have it we're having sex in public yes you look like a giant penis does that make you happy I have a penis over there if you want to see mine <laughs> do you think colombians are happier than catalans of course what makes you happy travel traveling enjoy the little things in the life the food <laughs> Don't care about anyone says dance. Dancing. So uh, definitely sex. Definitely sex. Dancing. Dancing. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. Easy, Danny. Easy, easy, easy. I'm leaving the weekly mag and I'm going. Where are we going? Going to Cali, to Colombia. <laughs> well, Mark, I have a question. Why was she dressed as a cone? Uh, she said that her husband-to-be was working in construction mm. and I don't know uh, exactly what a traffic cone has to do with construction. I, that was the answer she gave me. And you're very lucky I'm here today. I was so close to disappearing with that bunch of girls to a wedding in Cali in Colombia. That would, have made, that would have made me really happy. I feel very but I'm, happy. But I'm just as happy too. to be back here. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Danny had to pull me back in the car after with the shoot. He's like, come on, Mark, let's go. It's like, no, I'll just be 10 more minutes. Uh, yeah. Mm. Why, were they throwing themselves at you a bit? Or? Uh, well, I nobody think can was... resist him. No. Apparently not, no. <laughs> I think it's the camera. 
I think that people, when they see the camera, they, they see their five minutes of fame, you know, just around the corner, they might get discovered, no, they get all, you know, they do crazy things, things they wouldn't normally do mm. in daily life, kind of like myself. In front of the camera, I do a lot of things that in my daily day-to-day, -day, I don't do. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm another person. Exactly, you become mm -hmm. someone else. Exactly. Well, let's see, um, any particular happy moments from your own Stagnite? Our own what? Stagnite. Ah, if oh you my had God! One, of course. No, I don't believe in marriage. I've never been to one. You know, I, I no. <laughs> you know, okay. I really okay. think people shouldn't get married. So the last thing, you know, uh, I would go to is a stag night. Have you been to a stag night ever in your life? Yeah, no, God, he no, just no, said no. he never. didn't. Never, never, never. So you haven't gone through the whole thing of like, you know, dressing up as a girl or as something ridiculous, handing out free hugs, going to a strip club eating steaks, uh, drinking copious amounts of alcohol. Or being okay, okay, you can stop naked. here. This yeah. is the typical stag night. Mm. In, in yeah. A British Irish stag night is like this. I've been to two or three of them in my day. I had my own stag night a couple of two, two years ago, or last year, and it was easy. Went uh, paddle surfing, kayaking. It was very, very relaxed. So you you remember it as a happy moment? Yeah, for me, it was a happy moment. Yeah, but mm. the other ones I went to were quite crazy. <laughs> I, I don't know how much alcohol people can get inside them in 48 hours. That's really just the objective. Mm -hmm. and how stupid and ridiculous that you can look. But those girls actually seemed like they were having a lot of fun. They, yeah. We, we caught them enough. at the beginning of, it was in the, you know, the, the morning, so we caught them at the very beginning. I'm sure 12 hours later, uh, that girl would no longer be dressed as a cone. Mm -hmm. There are particular moments, uh, such as weddings. Uh, yeah. I know you've never been to one, but these moments when everybody expects you to be happy and have a good time. Do you guys, uh, have you experienced um, moments, uh, like that very happy moments in celebrations, like weddings or parties? Well, like I said, as I don't believe in marriage, when I do go to weddings, because there are times when it's almost obligatory, I feel very uncomfortable. And at one wedding, they have a tradition here, I don't know if this exists in Ireland, I don't think okay. it exists in Probably England. Probably not. Where um, the bride holds uh, like a bunch of flowers, okay. and then she throws the bunch of flowers at one of the guests, because she thinks that is the guest that's going to get married next, something like that. And so, you Don't know... they throw it behind them and whoever catches them is going to get married next? Is that like a superstition? Is that an American thing? That must be an American So the Catalans thing. grab and they throw it at you, no? They it's throw more it direct. at you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I was at this wedding and they threw it at me, you know, and I, I felt really uncomfortable because, <laughs> you know, I had no intentions of getting married. I'm not going to get married, you know. And, um, and I didn't really know what to say, you know, and it was about three quarters of the way through the ceremony, so uh -huh. also my, my mind was not as sharp as it might have been. And you, I just had a few babies. That's right, yeah, okay. that's the, exactly. That's the and, and it was like, I just felt very uncomfortable. I went all red and sort of said, you know, because I didn't want to say I don't believe in marriage at their wedding, but uh, so yeah, that was an embarrassing moment, yeah. Anyway, it's nice to be surrounded by, you know, um, by happy people, people who are hopeful, who love each other, you know, I, I think there's a um, Have you been to a rave? People energy. love each other there. <laughs> <laughs> if but, you ever go to a, but a, a, a music concert. you have concert. been to a few weddings, so uh, um, tell me about your experience oh God. in Ireland. Uh, to be honest, I don't really want to talk about weddings. I've been through so many of them and I kind of agree with Matthew on this one. I'm not a fan of them. Um, they don't, they're not exact, it's like happiness is being forced upon you, mm. so you kind of have to feel happy. Um, funnily enough, in Ireland, some of the best times I've had have been at funerals. And that may shock you, but we actually in Ireland have good fun at a funeral because it's, you're actually celebrating somebody's life and they're there with mm. you and we drink with the body in the middle of the thing, uh, in the middle of the room. Really? And I actually have funnier and happier memories of that than two people in a church getting married. Hmm, okay. Yeah? That sounds a bit strange. Because in, in Ireland as well, uh, you talked earlier about the fact that, you know, in London people are very unhappy and then when you go to Lancashire they're out in the streets and they're talking. That reminds me of Ireland as well. Yeah. But also, <clears throat> the Irish are very happy uh, with the failure of the English, which is also something ingrained in us, and also of the neighbour. You know, we have this uh, twisted sense of happiness when something goes wrong for somebody else. It's like we're knocking them off his pole. Okay, so this we have the kind of mm. double-edged happiness. Well, that's human. I it is. Yeah, I guess mm. so. I guess so. <laughs>
Anyway, um, as we're here to talk about uh, the, the, the difference you know, between here and there, mm -hmm. um, let me ask you, do you think that uh, Catalans are happy? Or the first time you came here, did you think Catalans seemed happy? Yeah, you guys are happy. Yeah, yeah the Catalans, sorry, you guys, uh, the Catalans, of course, they're, they're, they're quite, a happy, quite a happy bunch, but they love to complain too. There's a lot of, there's a lot of complaining, a lot of moaning, uh, I would have to compare them, for example, with the Americans and the Canadians because I've experienced living there. And man, they're so happy all the time. They seem like you know that they're so happy to be alive, and you know they got a lot of energy and positivity. And the Catalans just haven't reached that level yet for me yet. It, I'm not saying they're unhappy, but they haven't quite reached that those levels of happiness. What do you think? Yeah, I don't. I don't like that American thing though. No. It's sort of, you know, it's it's almost like. Uh, uh, it's, it's um, fake. No, it's, it's taboo it's to be un, to be unhappy. Yeah. But in fact, here I, I found right. I've been here for 34 years, and like I found that uh, Catalans actually uh, they know how to have a really good time. If you go into like any That's kind true. of uh, yeah, like yeah. if you go into a cheap restaurant on a yeah. Sunday midday lunchtime, uh, which is when a lot of Catalans go out to go mm -hmm. out to eat a cheap or a medium price a normal restaurant is what I mean. And, and you see a group of Catalans sitting around a table and they're just having a wonderful time. You know, they really know how to enjoy themselves. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I thought, you know, you know what you're, you're, you're right. Wouldn't you say the same of a bunch of people in a, a club or a pub in London? They seem happy too, no? Yeah, because oh. they've drank copious amounts of alcohol. Anybody would be happy with that much alcohol. I think he's making a good point here as well as that you guys, the Catalans do get together, they have lots of parties, festivals, castells, uh, they've, they've, you know, uh, all kinds of, uh, they get dressed up for, uh, when is it, Carnival, uh -huh. Halloween, and they, they know how to have a good time, I think. I think with this I agree. The thing about the bars, the Irish and the, the English in the bars and their singing and all that, there is alcohol involved. Let's not. <laughs> let's you know. Let's call a spade a spade. Always, we always. There always is. There. Apart from me, I don't drink. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there was the statistic that we got from uh, uh, from our scriptwriter Santi. He sent this fascinating statistic, which is that the the happiest people in the world in Europe are the the Danish. Mm -hmm. um, like they're right there at the top yeah. top of the That's list. That's true. I, and I went for the first time to Denmark this this summer, mm -hmm. and. Everybody drinks. Everybody. I mean, it's incredible. They started about midday with beer, which is the national drink, and uh, and they just go on go on drinking. And then I read another. I looked this up. I was found it so interesting. And apparently, the Danes are not only the happiest pe country in Europe. They're the country in Europe with the highest percentage of people who drink alcohol. Ninety-two percent. They also have a great so bike bicycles as well. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can we just not talk about yeah, bicycles? Yeah. I'm just as well? sorry. I'm sorry. But, um, Couldn't help it. Well, anyway, uh, Mark, tell us about um, the happiest moment of your life. Happiest moment of my life, 1999. I remember it clearly as if it was yesterday. Manchester United were 1-0 down against Bayern Munich, and they came back and scored two goals in the camp now here in Barcelona, and I cried like a little baby. I mean, I was 16 at the time, and I remember being surrounded by a load of fans, and they were all shouting for Bayern Munich, and I, I honestly, it was one moment that I connect with, and I felt so happy in that moment. I don't think it has ever reached that heights of being a Manchester United fan I ever see. again since mm -hmm. that moment. It's funny, one of my happiest moments was also in 1999, <laughs> but it was it was a different a different thing. I'd had my I'd done written my second book in Catalan. It was a collection of stories that had been turned down again and again. And I was getting really depressed. Struggling about writer. This. So, 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 just struggling writer. Yeah. So, somebody said, "Why don't you try and, you know, enter it in for a literary competition?" And they, they said, "Look, there's one in Valencia which is genuine. You know, it's not fixed. You, you know, they, if they like the book, they will, they'll give it an award." And I got lucky. I sent it in. I got lucky. I got the award. That's the first time I'd actually won an award since I was six years old when I got one for reading a, a piece of uh, children's book in a in primary school and so I went to Valencia and I uh, was sort of waiting all day for the the thing and then finally they they announced my name I walked out on the stage and all these people stood up and started applauding because of something I'd written and it for me it was just a moment of 
not an egotistical thing, but it was just bliss. Oh. You know, I, I just felt so happy, you know. So you were over the moon. I was over the moon. I was absolutely I wonder was it at the, the same day that I was happy? It would have been funny, you know, like the cosmic <laughs> forces, you know. That day in 1999, it never got better than that. Okay. <laughs> the whole right. life went down yeah. after that. Oh, it's downhill after <laughs> It's all that. downhill and we ended up here moaning about it. <laughs> today we talked a lot about um, um, sweet things, but do you like savory things and salty? Spicy food. food? Salty food, no, not, not no? much. I, I don't like the possibility of having a heart attack, so I try not, <laughs> to, not to eat salty food. Well, I'm just asking that uh, because last program we went to a Castells training session and this week the experience of the first timer section isn't that dangerous. Well, since our guest Melissa Lighty was pregnant, we took her to a visit to the salt mines in Cardona. So did you know there are different uh, types of salt, like three different types of salt in there? Well, nor did she. Discover more in the following video. Mary Poppins told us that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Well, in this occasion, we're not talking about sugar, right? We're talking about salt. So, Melissa. Had you ever seen something like this before? No, no, nothing, nothing like this before, actually. <laughs> and I've been living in Catalonia for about eight years now, and I've seen a lot of things here, but I've never been able to see the salt mines. Security first, Marisa. We must wear a helmet. I'm sorry about your hair. It's okay. <laughs> but now we're ready to get into the mountain. Are you ready? I'm ready. How are you feeling? I'm excited. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> it looks like snow. Is it salty? Yeah. Oh, oh my god. It's salt. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Are you Monse? Yes, I am. You will be our guide today, right? Yes, welcome to our natural wonder, Cardona Salt Mountain. There are like 80 meters of salt in the surface and like two kilometers underground, right? Yes, this is a vertical deposit of salt. From top to bottom is two kilometers. And on the surface, we have more or less 80 meters of salt. That's a lot of salt. So let's discover it. Yes, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> And salt is considered to be a very good disinfectant, antibacterial, so uh, take advantage of your visit. The air here is clean, so you can breathe deeply. Uh, you can see that there is a drop at the end of every ah. stalactite. You can touch it okay. and you can taste it. Mm. You'll be surprised. Well, yeah, it tastes a little like the ocean. <laughs> Here you can see mm, vertical red salt layers. The red color is due to the iron oxide impurities contained in the salt. I, it's hard to believe that this is also salt because it doesn't look, it looks like paint or stone. It's pink, it's so cool. From the outside, it's um, quite stark and quite barren and very simple. And then when you go inside, it's so elaborate and it's really beautiful. And um, the, there's so many different colors and textures and um, stalactites and it's a, it's a really interesting place. So Marisa, keep your eyes closed okay. because we're getting into a very, very special place, okay? Okay, okay let's stop. Uh -huh. And now, come here, okay. you can open your eyes. My goodness, it's amazing. It looks yeah. like we're underwater. Right? Yeah, it's incredible. This mine is very, very large. The total length of the galleries is about 300 kilometers. Only the first level is allowed to visit, and the deepest gallery is at 1,308 meters. There are three types of salt here the sodium chloride, the magnesium chloride, and the potassium chloride. And the most important type of salt is the potassium chloride because it's used to make explosives, fertilizers, and medicine. Monse, what are, what are these three containers here? What do they have in them? Here you can see the three types of salt. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to taste the potassium chloride? Can I? 
Yes, and what do you think? This type of salt tastes like... Oh, it's not salty. Normal salt, no? No, no. Oh. Is it the spicy? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like the taste of that salt. It was very spicy. It was it surprised me a lot. Um, it was a little bit like pepper, but mm, it was very strange, you know? <laughs> Should I? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's so many things to see and do here, and I learned a lot about salt that I didn't know, actually. I've studied literature and poetry, and I don't know anything about science and chemistry, so I learned about the fact that salt is antibacterial and that salt has um, uses in explosives and things like this that I, I didn't have any idea, so um, it made me think of salt in a whole new way. Say cheese. <laughs> I've just seen the salt mines in uh, Cardona. Have you ever um, picked uh, any products directly from the ground? Yeah, a few, a few years ago I spent half a day um, harvesting spring onions from a field, which is, uh, it, was for a, it was for a program, uh, and it was a field where all the other workers were Africans. And I, I wrote the script. The idea was to sort of find out, you know, what it was like to do that kind of work. And it was like half a day's work. They did obviously a whole day for at least five days a week. And it was backbreaking. I mean, by the time I'd finished that half day, picking up these bloody spring onions, it was, I, I just felt terrible. But what made it even worse was that the farmer who had to pay me because I'd done the work, he tried to pay me more than the African workers. Oh and the crew God. spotted it. Um, they said, why are you doing that? I said, yeah, why are you doing that? And he just thought, well, you know, I thought, I, I, I don't know. But in the end, he paid me the correct amount, mm. which was uh, uh, peanuts. I mean, it was a very small amount of money. So I sort of learned all about mm, the kind of work that those Africans were doing and about the kind of money they were getting paid to do it. But mm. it, was, uh, mm -hmm. it was a good experience. Interesting in experience, yeah. indeed. Uh, Any work? Yeah, well, we pick something from the ground in Ireland called turf. And turf is what we use in fires. Uh, we burn it, it's like peat, okay? And uh, I guess my biggest memory is growing up was that we had a part in a bog. A bog is a, a marshland area where you cut out these pieces of turf and then you have to turn it over and let them dry. And then you have to come and pick it up. It's, it's a really long process. It takes the whole summer to do in Ireland. And I remember helping my dad out. And a typical conversation in Ireland is like, we talk about bog weather, you know, like, is it good drying? Uh, talking about whether the stuff can dry out and stuff like that, so yeah. I know you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's really difficult to, to explain. Honest, no. <laughs> and maybe with some graphics at the end, we can show what exactly is turf. I think, you, do you know what turf and peat is? Peat, yeah. Peat. peat. Mm. But you don't know what a bog is. A bog marshland area where they cut it out and turn it upside down and then we use it to burn in fires, no? No, but I've, I've been at homes where they burn peat. Okay, and, so yeah. briquettes. Briquettes. This kind of thing, okay. yeah, we have, okay. we have turf. Now I see. So yeah, so, we would, we, I would have gone with my dad, we would have bought tea and sandwiches and gone with my grandmother and it was kind of like a family thing. It's actually not that bad, it mm -hmm. made me kind of happy as well because, mm. you know, you're getting your hands in the dirt. I didn't get paid peanuts, I didn't get paid at all, <laughs> but I had a warm house for the winter, so yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the future. Are you guys, um, uh, are you Matthew in this case, uh, one of those people who believe that high expectations for something can reduce the chances for you to have a happy experience. Not totally, no, it's a classic. You know, it's like the typical thing is when people say, you've got to see this film. It's the most <laughs> fabulous film. My God, I was in tears and then I laughed my head off. It's so good. So finally, you know, you go and see this film and it's kind of, you know, it's okay, you know, but it's nothing, <laughs> nothing special. And even worse is when they say, you've got to meet this person, you know, this oh, fabulous, really interesting person, you know, and <laughs> you end up meeting this, this sort of very average or even yeah. incredibly and boring person. there's no person, chemistry you know? at all, no? There's no mystery at all, no, mm -hmm. no, definitely. Okay, what about you, Mark? What do you think? Looking forward to the future, expectations. I'm in a moment where I'm actually practicing uh, 
to live in the moment. I used to spend so much time thinking about the future and the expectations of, of things that would make me happy if I could just reach that goal. And it was like, you know, the, the, the bottle or the, 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 the donkey and the carrot, no? You could never quite reach that moment of happiness, no? So I'm actually practicing at the minute, like this whole mindfulness thing, you know, like being happy in the oh. moment, being happy with what I have right now, right. being happy being with you guys here in this moment in time and uh -huh. not thinking about well, that's uh, a too much about mindfulness. The future. Is yeah, it, uh, I think it was the whole hostel reek experience, you know, the meditation <laughs> and everything. It kind of, I've come back a changed man. I refuse to go to Colombia for God's sake. What about next week? Well, next week we're talking about uh, daily routine. Yes, we and are. My question is, you know, um, is there something on your agenda for next week which you think will make you particularly happy? Yes, without any, any doubt whatsoever. In fact, you can probably almost guess what it is, Marcella. You're having coffee uh, with me. No. Well, you know, I like that, Mark, but I, it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. No, I'm going to walk around the lake in Bagnolas, that town near mm, Girona. Course. That's about eight kilometers, seven, eight kilometers. Then I'm going to sit down on a terrace next to the lake and have a glass of cava just as the sun is setting. And that is going to make me very happy indeed. Mm. And I do this almost every week. Sounds amazing. Mark? I really can't. Uh, d you must have a lot of time. How do you have enough time to walk around the lake and then sit down and have a glass of cava? That's wonderful. Well, I it's wish not I had that. Well, I think of it as work because you get ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to do anything that will make me happy? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to go and shoot another video with Danny. That's mm. actually in part okay. of my weekly routine and it actually does make me happy. That we have that feeling like of like <laughs> a co accomplishment when we finish. So, yeah, it sure. Sounds we'll go like to uh, good fun. Hmm? Maybe we'll go and shoot a Anyway, manual. I will take notes of these uh, expectations and next week we'll see if they have uh, made you happy. Anyway, thanks Matthew for coming. Thanks Thank you. Mark. Hmm? No problem. I've been really happy to have you here today. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been almost two hours since we started today's show. Fortunately, time flies by. I hope it's been a happy time for you too. And remember, that there are complimentary contents of the Weekly Mag on social networks. You can find us at, at the Weekly Mag TV. And I leave you with a quote by the famous Czech novelist and poet Milan Kundera. In his writings, he combines erotic comedy with political criticism and philosophical speculation. I'm sure you all know him. We'll be back next week. And meanwhile, remember, keep your English up and running. Ha <laughs> ha